It started with four animal friends from New York, released back into the wild for rehabilitation, only to be shipwrecked on a tropical paradise. From that concept, DreamWorks was able to squeeze out three films, a theatrical spin-off, and several animated series. I'm Brad with Wicked Binge, and today, we're taking on the world of Madagascar and counting down its beloved characters and ranking them on the morality spectrum. This is the Madagascar franchise, good to evil. Guess with a bull, you're gonna get the horns, private. Over the course of 15 years, the Madagascar series introduced us to a litany of furry faces. Today, however, we're sticking to the theatrical films. With that out of the way, let's move and move it down to our first entrant. As usual, we'll be working with the most pure and working our way down. These characters are the good. Our gold standard of good comes in the form of a penguin protege named Private, Skipper's young cadet and resident ray of sunshine. I want you to look cute and cuddly, Private. Contrasting the analytical and coarse demeanors of his teammates, Private maintains an upbeat, pleasant, and caring disposition. He followed orders to the best of his abilities, and never begrudged the treatment he received if he fell short of his brother's expectations of him. In fact, Private has proven himself emblematic of the series' core philosophy. As scary as change is, having a family to help you adapt makes everything easier. Can I kiss the bride, Skipper? No. For that, we're pleased to award him our gold medal. Coming in at a close second, we have Marty. He spends the bulk of the movie not knowing if he has white stripes or black stripes, but regardless, he has a heart made of solid gold. In fact, Marty's probably the most sympathetic we have on here. All he wants is a sense of belonging, something we can all relate to. Originally, this translates to wanting to find a new home. Just imagine going back to nature. Back to your roots. Later, it becomes a matter of melding with a herd of like-minded zebras. In every instance, though, it comes from a place of unashamed vulnerability. And ultimately, he allows his own struggles to take the back burner so he can help his friends. In fact, it's Marty's loyalty to his friends that saves Alex from a lifetime in isolation and then from certain death by drowning. Up next is Mort, an adorable little mouse lemur and frequently disgraced member of King Julian's court. Get up, Mort. Do not be near the king's feet. Now, if you've seen any of the spin-off series, you know that Mort has undergone some minor deviations in character since his debut. But for the sake of our discussion today, we do best to remember Mort as an innocent, childish, and somewhat unfortunate member of the cast, who's arguably not smart enough to ever intend any harm. In fact, Mort's a bit of an iron idiot and can usually shrug off whatever catastrophic damage he lands himself in. There's always plan B. <laughs> he lands where he does because, as far as the animals of Africa are concerned, he's responsible for saving their source of life, for having sent a particularly persistent shark to its death in an active volcano. It makes more sense in context. Next, we have Gloria. Gloria is the only female member of the main troop and is known for the maternal role she fills. She's certainly the most empathetic of the group, and she can be counted on to know when her friends need a pick-me-up. You don't bite the hand that feeds you. Mm-hmm, I know that's right. She's also demonstrated her ability to get done what she needs to. She was able to cow Alex physically into comforting a disparate Marty, made sure they had a cake ready to celebrate Alex's birthday, and coached Melman through his fears as a trapeze artist. In most cases, she's the one to hold her friends together when tempers are flaring, though she herself isn't immune to being temperamental at times. A romantic at heart, she wholeheartedly believes in taking care of herself in a relationship and breaks off a budding romance with her suitor, Moto Moto, when he conveys he only likes her for her looks. We will win. I'm huge. For all her goodwill, she knows she deserves to be respected. She eventually gets this when she starts a romantic partnership with Melman. Speaking of our resident sickly giraffe, Melman comes next. Now, he's definitely the least relatable of our main cast. He's a raging hypochondriac who comes across as rather neurotic. Be that as it may, Melman is inoffensive and loyal to his friends in the face of his many medical conditions. Oh, I'm in heaven. He really gets his chance to shine in the second movie. After he learns that the giraffes of Africa have no medical aid and simply pick out a dying hole when sick or injured, he becomes their new witch doctor. This demonstrates that he's self-aware, being motivated by his own medical concerns to alleviate those of others. He also shows that he isn't afraid to stand up for himself or for someone he loves. Listen, Mototo, you better treat this lady like a queen. 
Melman's tendencies can certainly be extensive and inconvenient, but he's far from a bad giraffe. In fact, as far as anxious giraffes go, he might just be the best. Following him is the Answer Man, or Answer Bird? Kowalski. Kowalski is the brains of the penguin's outfit and has a tendency to be cynical, but he's no stoic genius. He's actually very emotional, specifically where his brothers are concerned. And the bad news? We've broken our last shovel. His plans can usually be counted on to prioritize their safety, and while perhaps not as unquestioning as Rico or Private, he does trust Skipper's judgment and respects him as a commanding officer. Kowalski even manages to rustle up a few romantic inclinations for certain snow owls. He can be arrogant and even ostentatious, but Kowalski is definitely someone who sees the bigger picture, and that's definitely more than we can say for certain others on our list. But Kowalski, like the other older members of his brood, are far from perfect. In fact, Kowalski can usually be counted on to cause just as much damage as his siblings, with his malfunctioning inventions and occasional mad scientist urges. Kowalski. I say we use this setback to our advantage. But equally, like the rest of his team, they can be counted on to get the job done. Speaking of pragmatist, King Julian's royal advisor, Maurice, is up next. Besides Alex going feral, Maurice is the closest the first film has to a main antagonist, in that he naysays Julian's plan to foster and weaponize the main quartet. What if Mr. Alex is even worse than Nafusa? He toes the line between practical and prejudiced, but he's far from a malicious primate. Despite yielding to Julian's authority on principle, Maurice is easily the brains of their operation. Obviously, he cares for his kingdom, as it's his discernment that keeps Julian in line. The party is over, Julian. Your brilliant plan has failed. Maurice is also the only member of Julian's court to treat Mort with any consideration. His only real crime is aiding in the efforts to religiously sacrifice Melman in an effort to bring about rain. Believe it or not, there is worse things a guy can do. Alex the Lion is next. Our master dramatist and showman extraordinaire, Alex is truly DreamWorks' middle finger at the concept of subtlety. Perhaps owing to his lightning-fast dialogue and movement pattern, it's evident that Alex is far from DreamWorks' most subtle protagonist. I mean, just really, really, I mean, I tell you, it just doesn't get any better than this. In fact, even his best friends know him to be a show-off and even a bit lacking in empathy. But underneath all the glamour and vainglory, Alex isn't a bad guy. Of the main quartet, Alex is the most acclimated to his life as a zoo animal and the most detached from his new nomadic existence. Even when he begins to accept his current circumstances, it then becomes a matter of comparing them with his memories of New York. Predictably, he wrestles with his identity and who he is without a crowd to cheer him on. But Alex also has values. His love for his friends is never questioned, and he's capable of putting his own problems on pause to help someone. And even his the old ways were better mindset and desire to return to New York aren't totally selfish motives. I'm swimming back to New York! He's a benevolent king of the concrete jungle and he loved his subjects, and the public loved him. For Alex, it's less that he misses being a king and more that he knows people miss him. But even that isn't enough to ultimately pull him away from his friends. When he gets his chance to go back at the end of the trilogy, he doesn't take it for the lonely implication he comes to see in his old life. That's growth. Then we have our cute and cuddly master of espionage, Skipper. As the leader of the Penguins, Skipper can usually be counted on to maintain control over a situation. Cute and cuddly, boys. Cute and cuddly. He holds his teammates and himself to a high standard, but also has a soft spot for each of them as his brothers, particularly Private, who he has a marked tendency to baby. However, Skipper is also the most pragmatic of the Penguins and the happiest to make tough sacrifices, at least when the sacrifice is being made by someone else. Come on, take the bait. He's also apparently a war criminal, so all things considered, he places pretty well in the low tier of the good guys. Next is Skipper's weapons expert and one-man demolition crew, Rico. Arguably, Rico makes the most sacrifices for the team in carrying their arsenal around in his digestive system, but Rico never once utters a complaint or anything else ever. But equally, Rico's rudimentary vocalizations and coarse mannerisms imply that he rather enjoys the chaotic demands of his rank. And shut him up! He's a firecracker to be sure, but not an unfeeling one. Just as Skipper's authoritative personality ultimately comes across as parental, Rico's explosive nature comes across as quirky and cuddly, particularly in the Penguin spinoff 
and in Europe's Most Wanted. He doesn't place lower because he's undeniably a good brother and quartermaster, but he doesn't place as high as, say, private for his violent tendencies. Plus, I feel like if we gave him a medal, he'd just swallow it. Coming in like a flaming tiger, next we have Batali. Batali is first introduced to us as a traumatized performer who once flew too close to the sun and got burned for it. For most of the first act of the third film, he's surly, unhelpful, and disgraced. Which one of you is leader? Batali is guilty of sloth, in that in his sadness, he does give up on the animals who need him. He also resists the efforts to revive the circus on grounds of sticking to traditionalism. When the zoo animals reignite his spirit, however, he remains grateful enough to them that he's the first to join in their rescue effort, even after it appeared they had betrayed him. Stubborn though he might be, Batali is just a tiger who cares about his art. There are things you can fault him for, but that isn't really one of them. We can do impossible. Our next entrant should be remembered solely by being Bernie Mac's final performance before his death. Alex's father, Zuba. Zuba only appears in one film, and much of his character development is rooted in being Alex's long-lost father. But he does leave a lasting impression as both a husband and a leader. My son is home. He's a dedicated and popular public servant to the reserve he presides over, so much so that his people demand him at the first sign of crisis. But he isn't taking home any trophies for Father of the Year, at least not at first. For all the shame the incident caused him, Zuba's own pride was a factor in his son's abduction when he was an infant. This pride resurfaces, along with many other emotions when he discovers Alex alive years later. We mentioned earlier that Alex's happiness is tied to his identity as a performer. Zuba, as his father, has to work to be okay with that. Is he dancing? What is he doing? And in fairness, it does take an extensive set of circumstances for Zuba to validate Alex's worldview. However, he was willing to relinquish his throne rather than banish his son as custom dictated. And eventually, he does come around to appreciating his unique talents. He even joins in with him at the end of the movie before dancing off into the sunset. We miss you, Bernie. With that said, we now enter the gray area. Phil and Mason are next. Certainly the most human out of the animal cast, these learned primates are specifically out for themselves. The chimps are not the most intelligent duo, but they are certainly the most acclimated with human cultural structures like language and communication. If you have any poo, fling it now. Phil and Mason can always be counted on using their skills as leverage to get what they want, even at the expense of others. To be fair, much of their self-servitude was present in a debate environment, so you can't really fault them for knowing their worth in a time of crisis. And honestly, their negotiations over workers' rights with Skipper might be the single funniest part of the second movie. All right, you get your maternity leave. Next is Moto Moto the head honcho hippo of the watering hole with a really disconcerting fat fetish. Yes, girl. You huge. Yeah, this is one of those memes that just aged really weirdly. He places where he does because he sort of exists to further romantic tension between Melman and Gloria, and Melman is the overlooked friend zone guy. Emoto is just a desirable airhead who only values Gloria for her appearance. It isn't his fault, it's just that he's only really there to make one of the tiredest tropes in entertainment happen, and that's not really something we can forgive. Regardless, for being superficial, he never demonstrates himself as a bad guy. He leads the charge to dig for water when the reserve dries out, which is a pretty viable solution, and he doesn't even take umbrage to Gloria choosing Melman. He could probably be worth all the memes years later if he weren't so one note, but that's not really something you can be mad at him about. Nearing the bottom of our neutrals is King Julian, Lord of the Lemurs. To say nothing of the primate he is in the spin-off material, King Julian is the most hedonistic ruler in recent memory, though he wasn't a bad Lord of Lemurs nor a particularly unpopular one. Please feel free to bask in my glow. In fact, he's beloved enough by his subjects to be celebrated regularly, which in turn has left him with bit of an ego. After the first movie, when he begins a tour of the world, he treats the whole affair like a conquest, and appropriately styles himself as a leader of whatever land or group he happens upon. Hello, New Yorkers! Your new king is here! His love of music and lack of intelligence hold him back somewhat, but otherwise he's a good ally for the main quartet, but he's also only in it for himself. 
in his treatment of his underlings, Mort especially, doesn't win any favors. He also manages to rally the animals of the reserve using only his charisma, then convince them to throw one of their own into an active volcano. If nothing else, he just wants everyone around him to have as good of a time as he's having. Titsi is next on the list. He's another character who doesn't commit any egregious sins. In fact, he doesn't actually seem to bear any ill will towards our protagonist. Titsi is named for the Tetsi fly, an insect vector for the sleeping sickness. Appropriately, he himself is perpetually drowsy and lethargic, unless he's properly awoken for a physical challenge. In his anger over being woken up, Titsi is a merciless fighter and a physical behemoth. Come on, Titsi fly. Fly. He does unwittingly aid Makunga's scheme to take over the watering hole, but this is done more or less unknowingly, and, ignorant as he was, Alex did challenge him first. He's a bit of a circumstantial villain, but certainly on the darker side of morally gray. Finally, we arrive at the dark side. These characters are the bad and the evil. The Fossa are next. The Fossa are a loose confederation of lemur-eating weasels who frequently terrorize Julian's kingdom. The horses will come back and gobble us with their mouths. They aren't the main antagonists of the first movie for their ineptness and cowardice. Regardless, they do have a voracious appetite and serve as a catalyst to Alex's mental decline in the first movie. But the Fossa are also the only characters in the first movie to get royally screwed over. They're not particularly malicious, just hungry, and they get mauled brutally by animals much bigger than them in the climax. This all culminates in the Fossa effectively being scared out of their own territory and left to starve to death. So, ah, there's that. Nana takes our penultimate spot before the big bads, but she doesn't place where she does for lack of trying. Now, Nana isn't someone who throws her own under the bus. It should at least be said of her that she's a natural survivor, and that, in the second movie, she showed genuine care in helping her fellow stranded New Yorker survive the African wilderness. We can make it anywhere! However, she wasn't benevolent enough to pass up a meal, something that Alex had to learn the hard way. She also defeats the movie's primary antagonist, but she's not a sweet old lady. <laughs> that much is obvious. Nana is incredibly hostile and dangerous, even more so in the accessory material, but perhaps nothing quite demonstrates this better than the brutal beatdown she merits on Alex during the first movie, later mentioning that Alex deserved the beatdown for being a bad kitty. He was a very bad kitty. Dave the Octopus takes home our bronze medal. Nana has Dave beat in terms of blatant hostility, but the cephalopod lands here for the scope of his grand design, which is the only villainous aspiration in the series. Let's shake up some old memories. He's not the most complex villain in the world. He was rejected by the humans in favor of cuter animals. So now, he wants to take his abandonment issues out on the cuter penguins instead of the humans who rejected him, because that somehow makes sense. Dave is perhaps somewhat sympathetic in that he's the only villain motivated by pain rather than pride, but they never really do anything with that. And that's fine, because the core theme of the movie is supposed to be the brother's relationship anyway, but it does make Dave a pretty weak villain. You mm. think this is over? So he takes bronze for favor of other characters, something he should probably be used to by now. Our silver medal villain is Dubois, who is perhaps the most formidable villain of the series. Dubois is a series' take on the classic animal catcher bad guy. She has an established body count and a deep-seated hatred for animals, and is a literal force of nature when tailing her prey. Now you deal with me. She was a ruthless woman with some vicious tendencies, like keeping trophies from her past victims in her office and scrapping with the Vatican police. She's at least principled enough to care about her men, if only for their potential as her soldiers. She even rallies them by appealing to their patriotism, rather than by coercion. But Chantal Dubois is an unmistakably bad person, easily the worst human we have to show. The worst character, however, is Makunga, Alec Baldwin as a selfish rival for Zuba's throne. The guy is actually low enough to be Zuba's long-lost son, returning as a catalyst for his coup d'etat. I'm going to use him to get rid of Zuba once and for all! And then he runs the watering hole into the ground once he assumes power. It's definitely a Lion King-esque feel that comes with this guy, but unlike Scar, he's not even enough of a ruler to stand by his crumbling kingdom. 
He schemes for years, dethrones and nearly destroys a family, all in the name of a throne he only wants for his own vanity. In the face of certain drought, he even commands that the little water remaining will have to be fought over, a fight he would certainly win. We'll all have to fight for it. But Kanga is the worst. He cheats, lies, and destroys to get the power he wants to stroke his massive ego, and then allows the people who count on him to suffer. Just about the only thing he's good at is being terrible. So that's our list for the good and not so good folks of Madagascar. But who do you think is the best and worst? Let us know in the comments section below. Don't forget to hit that notification bell and binge our Good to Evil playlist, where we break down the morality of the characters in your favorite cartoons, shows, and movies. But most importantly, stay wicked.